For more than 100 years, national parks in the United States have been dominated by a philosophy known as monumentalism. From the early days of Yosemite and Yellowstone all the way up to the present day, monumentalism has influenced nearly all aspects of our national park system. From which national parks were even created in the first place, to what sizes those parks were, to what activities were to be allowed within them, monumentalism has been there. Even today, your perception of the best and worst national parks has probably been influenced by monumentalism. Alright, let's start off with a discussion of what monumentalism even is. I've said this word so many times already, but I haven't told you what it actually means. It's quite simple. Monumentalism is the belief that our national parks should only protect the most monumental scenery in America. The largest, most grand, most spectacular, most scenic places. It's all to do with pretty places to look at. It's to this philosophy of monumentalism that we owe the creation of some of our earliest national parks, like Yellowstone, like Yosemite, like Sequoia and General Grant, which would later become Kings Canyon, like Mount Rainier, like Grand Canyon. All of these places were advocated for and ultimately protected as national parks because of how monumental they were. In Yosemite, that was the towering granite monoliths of the Yosemite Valley. In Yellowstone, it was geysers in the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone. In Sequoia and General Grant, it was big trees. In Mount Rainier, it was a big mountain. And in Grand Canyon, it was the Grand Canyon. Now, I don't think anyone today would argue that it was a mistake protecting these places. Certainly not. These parks are beloved and absolutely worthy of our love and adoration and, yes, protection. But despite the successful preservation of these iconic landscapes, thanks in large part to monumentalism, you need to understand that this philosophy has a more complicated story. And understanding that philosophy can give us some real insight into why our national parks look and operate the way they do today. See, the prevailing perception of monumentalism through history has been solely as this benevolent movement to protect America's natural heritage. That these big, monumental, scenic landscapes were America's version of European antiquities. These were our cathedrals and ancient ruins. These were our monuments, natural monuments. They were uniquely American and worthy of protecting. Except that perception of monumentalism is just not true. Well, okay, it, it's partially true. That was a factor in protecting our early national parks, and it was a part of the story. I don't want to give you the impression that it wasn't, but it isn't the whole story. Just as large a part of the story was the fact that monumentalism had economic motivations. In nearly every instance of a national park being created, there has been a discussion of whether or not those lands were worthless meaning economically worthless. If they were, great, then yes, you can put a national park there. But if there was timber, important mineral resources, agricultural opportunities, or later on, oil and gas resources, that was a problem because it meant preservation was coming into conflict with economic development. And economic development almost always won that battle. Now, here's where monumentalism fits into this discussion. One. It was thought that these monumental landscapes, Yellowstone, Yosemite, Mount Rainier, etc., were economically worthless. You couldn't grow crops on the sheer vertical cliffs of the Yosemite Valley. You couldn't drive cattle on the high elevation frozen tundra of Yellowstone. There were no trees to be harvested on the icy glaciated slopes of Mount Rainier. These places were thought to be static, unchanging monumental pieces of scenery frozen in time, and pretty to look at. These places weren't thought to have any practical economic value, and thus they were given the okay to be protected as national parks instead. The other way monumentalism interacted with this worthless lands approach was that it restricted the size of the parks that were created. Congress was happy to set aside the worthless parts of these landscapes as parks, but they were very careful to draw their boundaries in such a way 
as to exclude potentially economically important resources like timberlands or valuable mineral lands. Thus, Yosemite excluded the forest which surrounded it, at least initially, as did Mount Rainier and Crater Lake, because those forests had value as potential timberlands. General Grant National Park, protecting only a single grove of giant sequoias, was initially only 2,000 acres. Grand Teton National Park initially only protected the mountain range itself, not the ecologically important lowlands at their base. Again, these surrounding landscapes were seen as economically valuable and thus excluded from the national park boundaries. The only reason Yellowstone ended up being as big as it did was because people simply didn't know what was there. So you have monumentalism and this worthless lands approach kind of going hand in hand. Like, yes, there was a genuine drive to protect these places, again, driven by a desire to protect what was seen as America's natural heritage, but that desire only went so far as it didn't interfere with the economy. And here's why this matters. It set a precedent. A precedent that national parks were important, yes, but not so important as to usurp the nation's ability to develop its natural resources and profit from them. It also set the precedent that parks looked a certain way, that they were monumental, and that if something didn't measure up to the grandeur of a Yosemite or a Yellowstone, then it wasn't worthy of national park status. These precedents would lead to conflict after conflict, decade after decade in the fight to protect America's national parks. Let's go over a few examples. Some of these I've already covered here on the channel in much greater detail, but the idea here is to show you just how influential the philosophy of monumentalism has been throughout the history of national parks in America. Some of the most well-known and most contentious debates about national parks and public lands in this country can trace their direct roots to monumentalism and the way of thinking it reflected. For instance, take Hetch Hetchy. Yosemite was initially protected under the monumentalism approach, under the idea that it was worthless for anything except scenery. Except if you were to, say, build a dam within that scenery in the Hetch Hetchy Valley of Yosemite National Park, then Yosemite would not be worthless at all. It would be valuable for its ability to have hydropower extracted from it. This battle over Hetch Hetchy was an important early test of the monumentalism philosophy, one that it ultimately failed. Hetch Hetchy shattered a central tenet of monumentalism, that Yosemite was only valuable as a piece of scenery, and opened the door to a whole host of challenges to the supposed sanctity of our national parks. Similar fights over dams and national parks would rear their head in the Grand Canyon, Yellowstone, Glacier, and Dinosaur National Monument over the years. In each of these cases, the parks prevailed, although the victory at Dinosaur came at considerable cost, but the fact that these attempts were even made at all shows the limits of monumentalism. Eventually, our understanding of biology and ecology got to a point where protecting and managing national parks was just as much about protecting ecosystems and wildlife as it was protecting the scenery they inhabited. Biological management came to overtake monumentalism as the predominant philosophy by which we protected and managed national parks, as evidenced by the additions of parks like Everglades and Denali to the system. And yet, still the specter of monumentalism lingered. Grand Teton is a great example of this. Again, initially only the Teton Mountains themselves were protected as a national park, because they were just mountains, and mountains were monumental and seen as economically worthless. But as it became clear that the lowlands at their base were ecologically important habitat, efforts were made to incorporate these lands into the park. Detractors of this effort used the monumental argument that these lands were not worthy of being a national park that their value as ranching lands outweighed their value as ecologically important lands. Eventually, the lowlands were added to the park, but not after decades of bitter fighting and controversy. And again, monumentalism and the decades of ingrained thinking that followed from it lay at the heart of this fight. You can find similar controversies with similar refrains throughout the decades in the creation of Redwoods National Park, the creation of Canyonlands National Park, the creation of national parks in Alaska, the enlargement of parks like Yosemite and Grand Canyon. The list goes on and on. 
Even Bears Ears National Monument, while not a national park, can be viewed through the monumental lens. Proponents of the monument see the entire landscape as archaeologically and culturally significant, while its detractors claim that only those areas worthy of protection should be part of the monument, meaning the scenic parts. The other parts, they say, should be open to resource extraction. That is a monumental argument if I've ever seen one. And in fact, these debates are always framed around the conservation versus preservation debate, the wise use debate. But if you think about it, that framing itself is an offshoot of monumentalism, going all the way back to the days of worthless lands. This idea that we can only protect scenic and beautiful places that are viewed as economically worthless while ignoring the complex, dynamic, interconnected ecological relationships that we now know exist on these landscapes. Today, I often see the still lingering effects of monumental thinking in the way we talk about, say, the best and worst national parks. I see these articles and lists and videos of the worst national parks, and the complaints are always, nothing to see, or too boring, or nothing to do. That's monumentalism! That's the grip that monumentalism still has on us when it comes to what we expect our national parks to look like, and it's why I get so frustrated with this discourse. Monumentalism has become so ingrained in what we think a national park should be, that we think every national park has to have these grand vistas and scenic landscapes and towering mountains. And if it doesn't, then that is all of a sudden a bad park, not worthy of our time or visiting or love or protection. When we only focus on scenery, we lose sight of the incredible diversity of plants and animals and ecosystems and cultural landscapes and historical artifacts that our national parks protect. We lose sight of the incredible stories that these parks have preserved within them. I mean, one of the big reasons why I make the types of videos that I make is to highlight why parks are special beyond their monumental scenery. My videos are a reaction to the monumental way of thinking that has gripped national parks for so long. I don't want to make videos telling you about the best and worst national parks. I don't want to make videos that show you the best place to take an Instagram picture. I want to make videos that cut deep to the heart of national parks, that expose their soul, their very essence. I want to ask questions of these places and our relationships with them. I want to show you that they're not just pretty pieces of scenery. A place like Congaree has one of the tallest broadleaf tree canopies in the world and protects an ecosystem that is now largely missing from our landscape because of centuries of logging and draining. Cuyahoga Valley is a true ecological success story, having gone from a river that catches on fire to a thriving protected parkland. Indiana Dunes has more biodiversity within it than the entire state of Hawaii. Hot Springs has been protected since 1832, charting a long history of preservation in this country. Each of these parks and others are constantly derided as the worst in the system because there's nothing to see or there's nothing to do or they're boring, but I refuse to see them that way. Only when you hold them to an impossible standard and judge them against an outdated conservation philosophy could you come to the conclusion that these places are not worthy national parks. Okay, I am now out of energy, so let's uh, wrap this thing up, shall we? I spent a lot of time just now actively obliterating the philosophy of monumentalism in this video, but I don't want to leave you with the impression that it's all bad. Certainly, we needed monumentalism to create our first national parks, and to that, we owe it a huge debt. It's just that now it is an outdated philosophy which has failed to account for changes in thinking and management, and yet still lends an outsized influence on the way we think about and manage our parks. I hope this video has given you a fuller picture on this flawed yet influential philosophy that has so impacted our national parks. I'd love to hear your thoughts on it in the comments, 
And if you start trying to tell me about the best and worst national parks down there, I will know that you didn't even watch the video or at the very least missed the point of it. And don't bring up Gateway Arch either because I already have a video on that too. You can go and leave your comments over there. So just don't do it, okay? Just don't do it. Uh, support for National Park Diaries is always greatly appreciated on Patreon. Uh, follow me on Instagram and thanks for watching. I'll see you next time. Goodbye.